America obliterates half of North Vietnam's MiG-21 fleet in 13 minutes, otherwise known as Operation Bolo by the fat electrician. Ah yes, that time during the Vietnam War where the United States Air Force finally agreed to let a double fighter ace pilot from World War II run the show, he then immediately saw to the destruction of over half of North Vietnam's state-of-the-art fighter jets, and he did it in 13 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Today we're talking about Operation Bolo, one of the greatest ruses in military history. But first, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> When I told you to get a hobby, this isn't what I meant. You said I could pick up fishing. Not like this. <laughs> why? Get out of my hair. I don't know why she's mad. This is way better than real fishing. Fishing Clash lets you catch way more fish than you ever could in real life from locations all across the world from the comfort of your own home. Not only that, the game's completely customizable, allowing you to unlock and upgrade all of your equipment and even building your own fishing village. They also have daily and weekly events allowing you to compete against other people. You can also join a clan and play with your friends. They also just partnered with Major League Fishing to sponsor the Angler of the Year Awards. So if you guys want to give it a try, there's a QR code right there as well as a link and a gift code down below. When you use my gift code FATFISH, you're going to get $20 worth of free equipment and power-ups as well as a one-of-a-kind avatar now i'm gonna get back to fishing <laughs> i'm gonna be honest i was i was digging this and then halfway through i realized we're talking about fish i i can't escape this fish it's it's actually becoming a little bit of a problem i have people sending me kokumi memes from genshin impact because her, her scarf or whatever has like a little fish tail people are just sending me fish memes at this point like it's actually actually a problem <laughs> He's never going to get out of this house. We're never nope. going to have a minute by ourselves. Nope. Unless he leaves that room. My God. I know how to get him out of this house. Finally, some peace and quiet. Everybody oh. else is freezing their ass off in their ice fishing huts, and I'm <laughs> catching more fish than them inside my own house. Yeah. Oh, Nicholas. Yes? Oh, no. What's your uh, discount code for that little game? Fat fish. Why? Because I've decided to join you. But, uh, <laughs> I mobile on. But, <laughs> but it's winter out. But, but is that a double entendre? Let's see this little game. <sighs> is, is that in itself a meme, Ooh. mowing the lawn? Cast. Release. All right, so Operation Bolo takes place within another mission known as Operation Rolling Thunder. and Oper We need to talk about that ad read for a second. That was the long game. I liked that. Also, the ingenious part at the end, while a lot of people might write that off as, oh, cool, his wife is coming in, his wife was coming in, playing it. It also showcases how easy this game is to pick up, how user intuitive it is, <laughs> right? There, there's definitely that that thought and foreplanning that went into that. I thought it was great, honestly. Solid out of 10 ad read. Operation Rolling Thunder spans from March of 1965 until November of 1968. It is essentially the air war over North Vietnam, so super brief, oversimplified version of what's going on. The American forces are in South Vietnam, and they are fighting the VC, or the Viet Cong, which mm -hmm. is a guerrilla fighting force. And that guerrilla fighting force is receiving supplies from the North Vietnamese via the Ho Chi Minh Trail, so America needs to try to shut down those supply lines. Logic being, if the enemy doesn't have supplies to fight, the enemy can't fight. Real base level War 101 Sun Tzu type stuff, right? right. Okay, well, America pretty much has two options they can a invade north vietnam with ground forces or they can b just attempt to bomb the holy fuck out of them and america's going yeah. to option b and that is what operation rolling thunder is it is just a humongous three-year-long air bombing campaign where america is going to try to blow up so much north vietnamese infrastructure that they can't continue to support the Viet Cong. which honestly it's a really good plan what's the problem the enemy's got nice things oh we'll take the nice things away send the planes in bomb mm -hmm. the roads bomb the railroad tracks and make it so they can't give the enemy a bunch of supplies it's it's good it should work and then the politicians got involved and let's face it if anybody could mess up something so simple it's going to be a politician because well honestly they could probably fuck up boiling water so how on earth did they mess it up well they gave the american military a bunch of rules of engagement which is a fancy way of saying they gave the american military a bunch of rules that only they have to follow and the enemy doesn't essentially tying the u.s military's hands behind its back and then sending them into battle anyways right. and one of these rules of engagement or one of these protocols that they had to abide by was that every plane that went into to North Vietnam to bomb them had to travel through a particular air corridor and that is the only route they were allowed to take in to North Vietnam meaning I don't know about the politicians of this era I could absolutely see there being people that would call them absolutely just horrific names dirty filthy snakes traitors etc because this most likely will get people unalived 
if you have to fall and that's the thing i i don't know i don't know enough about this era realistically nor do i really care to dive into politics itself what i can say and what i'm willing to really kind of discuss is that there needs to be some military cognizance or military service as a requisite for these positions that's like if you gave me a battle plan hey kip what are we doing with this right why one why do i have access to this battle plan two why do i have access to information that i shouldn't have three why am i controlling where people deploy four why am i effectively having the lives of people of soldiers in my hand without the requisite experience or understanding that's really what i can get behind and i think anybody across any spectrum is going to look at that as a that's kind of Excuse me. That's kind of reasonable, actually. That that that's reasonable. You you shouldn't have access to sending people to locations where they may or may not be unalive. And honestly, yeah, I completely agree with that. Like, I have, I don't know. It's just weird to me. I, I definitely could see some people getting very upset with these decisions. And then pretty much immediately, the North Vietnamese picked up on the pattern that every single plane that flies into their country follows a particular path, and they then <laughs> proceeded to take all of their surface-to-air missiles, all of their radars, all of their anti-aircraft capabilities in the entire country and put them in this one particular spot. And then the U.S. government decided to keep making their guys fly right through it anyways the entire time. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, oh my god, the politicians might actually secretly be geniuses because what they've done is they have inadvertently gotten the North Vietnamese to gather all of their anti-aircraft resources into one location and now we can just bomb those take them out and they'll have nothing left and it'll just be green light go everywhere so see you would think that and honestly this was okay they're gathering them together no one that would require foresight and planning two that would require a certain level of intelligence and cognizance as well as potentially military training to go along with that three the, the prior rules of engagement, the ROEs that were discussed, I, I guarantee you there's going to be something with those. Now the U.S. military is like, yo, politicians, can I blow that shit up now because it's right there just waiting for me? To which the politicians no. are like, absolutely not. In fact, we're going to make it a rule that you're not allowed to bomb or attack any anti-aircraft sites, any surface-to-air missile arrays, any anti-aircraft anything. You have to leave it yeah. completely unscathed. Yeah. And our logic behind that is that at those sites, there could potentially be a Chinese or a Soviet advisor that's helping out the North Vietnamese. And if we hurt one of them, it would upset the Soviets or the Chinese. And then that would be bad diplomatically even though they're blatantly there to help run a proxy war against us we're gonna go ahead and care more about them than we are about our own pilots so we're gonna go ahead and just have you guys keep flying through that same air channel through all the yeah. anti-aircraft everything because fuck you that's why this, is this does come down to plausible deniability this does come down to pl well well we know that this is a proxy war between x and y and us right they know this is a proxy war but nobody from x or y from russia or china in this era what was was harmed and we're worried about harming them because then at a certain point they can you know we can have russia or china explain hey why are you harming us you know we're gonna have to escalate things this all gets into just foreign policy and macro political issues this i'm going to put it this way there are many many military advisors that are paid way more way better than i am and have a much deeper education and understanding than i have i i can say things like the red scare was going on at this point capitalism versus communism is a huge you know pressure at this point and you know i understand where they're coming from i do at the end of the day soldiers aren't just statistics on a board on a sheet on a screen they are human beings and at the end of the day if you make a order that is going to cost soldiers uh the, they have to pay the ultimate price that price is also on your hand regardless of if you gave an order or strictly a politician this is you made that order you chose to make that decision Bullshit. So that's exactly what happens. Every single time they fly a mission, every Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps plane has to fly through the same air corridor through a gauntlet of anti-aircraft capability on their way to deliver their payload. And then if that wasn't bad enough, the North Vietnamese got their hands on somewhere between 12 and 16 MiG-21s. And if you don't know, at this point in time, the MiG-21 is a new cutting edge Soviet fighter jet. It is incredibly fast. It has a very high flight ceiling and it is very, 
very nimble. And using these MiG-21s, they very quickly develop a strategy that amounts to basically guerrilla warfare in the sky, utilizing a hit and run tactic. So their strategy is that they are gonna go specifically after the F-105 Thunder Chief, AKA the Thud. It is the number one plane that America is using in Operation Rolling Thunder mm -hmm. in all of their bombing runs. And when it is weighed down with a bunch of bombs, it is basically a sitting duck for a MiG-21. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is every time a bunch of thuds get sent out on a bombing run, they have to fly through that corridor of anti-aircraft capabilities and the arrays and everything else tells the enemy that it's a bunch of F-105s going on a bombing run. So they scramble the MiG-21s, they go up there, they intercept these F-105s, at which point one of two things can happen. The F-105s can continue on their bombing run and most likely get shot down by the MiG-21s or mm -hmm. they can drop their payload just over the jungle randomly in the middle of nowhere, not on target, and then make an escape and live. And bear in mind, the North Vietnamese only have a couple of these fighter jets and they're fighting a war of attrition against a much larger industrial force like America. So they are more than happy to send a plane up there, burn a little bit of fuel, get the Americans to drop tens or hundreds or millions of dollars worth of bombs on the middle of nothing, waste all their money, waste all their time, and then take their planes and land. They don't need to go out there and waste all their missiles and risk their planes. They're just gonna get the Americans to waste all of their bombs on nothing. And I know what you're thinking. That seems like a pretty easy problem. What if we just bombed the MiGs while they were on the ground? Or what if we bombed the airfields that they were coming from? That way they couldn't even take off. Well, of luckily engagement. we have politicians to step in and tell us once again, you're not allowed to bomb those either because there could potentially be an advisor from China or the USSR there. So leave those alone too. You are only, you're only allowed to take out enemy planes when they're in the air. To which the US- I had a comment recently that was just like, oh, I don't have any love of the military. It's just all bureaucracy and stuff. I want to just state that one in this, from this presentation by the fat electrician, one, this is not even the military making this. This is a separate body making these rules, making these rules of engagement. Two, I could care less about the military chain of command personally, but once again, civilian. So technically, I don't I have to like if I'm based right, I'm sure I have to, you know, observe certain senior commanding officers. Right. But realistically, it's not like an answer to an SO or a, a, a an officer above me. Um, I'm more for the boots on the ground or the person doing the work. I could care less about the bureaucracy and the management side of things, especially when you have uh, news of certain Air Force generals come out in recent times and uh, other certain events that end up happening. And I, I really could care less about the chain of command. My focus here, the people that I respect going into this are going to be the people that want to go and making a difference and try to make a difference and spend their time to do what they can to make an impact on the world, to change the world in their own way, only to get burdened down with bureaucracy and a number of other things. And then after they get out of service, get treated like utter garbage. And it, 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 I, I can rant on that for hours. We're, we're going to save that there, but no, this is at a certain point. When do you just scratch your head and question? Okay. But if we're restricted by so many ROEs, how is the other side going to be held accountable? How, how, how is this, you know, <laughs> this leads to a whole slew of questions. And if they can't answer that, what is the data that they're using to enforce this or make these rules of engagement? And two, I mean, what is their standing to be able to do that? What is their experience in military history, in military education? Have they gone to West Point? Have they gone to another academy, right? If they haven't, and I, why are you commenting on this? military is like okay i i guess we'll do the literally the only thing we can do we'll just send up our fighter jet the f4 phantom 2 and try to go toe to toe with the mix okay so the stage is set we have one of the sexiest airplanes of all time the american f4 phantom 2 going toe to toe with the soviet mig 21 okay here's what i need you to understand about this matchup this is pretty much the golden era of military planes okay in my opinion it's right before stealth technology came out and planes started to get a little bit slower because they could be sneaky now no planes built during this period were just straight Straight up, let's be fast as fuck and carry a ton of firepower. It's right. the hot rod era of military planes. And both of these planes are built on that doctrine. The F-4 Phantom tops out at like 1,400 miles an hour. The MiG-21 tops out at like 1,300 miles an hour. The mm -hmm. F-4 Phantom is like twice the size of the MiG-21. It's got a way bigger fuel tank. It's got way more range. It can carry a lot more payload. The MiG-21, on the other hand, it's a lot smaller. It's a lot lighter. It's nimbler, but it doesn't have as much range. So the MiG-21 in an up-close dogfight is probably probably going to be better with its gun, whereas the F-4 Phantom 
not really intended for up close dogfighting, it doesn't even have a gun. Because it has a more advanced radar and missiles that can take the enemy out from 29 miles away, it doesn't even need to see the enemy to shoot them out of the sky, so why on earth would it need a gun? Okay, the F4 Phantom's MO is to haul ass, shoot half court shots, and have a dope ass paint job the entire time it does it. So, just so we're on the same page, Soviet MiG-21, American F4, very much peers to one another. They are both capable of taking the other out. They both pose a huge threat to one another. However, mm -hmm. theoretically speaking, the MiG-21 should have an advantage in an up-close dogfight due to its maneuverability and its gun, whereas the F4 has the advantage because it can just shoot down the MiG-21 before it even gets close enough for a dogfight to occur. So, right. MiG-21, better up close. F4, better far away. So that's it. That's the solution, right? The F4 Phantoms are going to go up. They're going to shoot the MiGs down from like 20 miles away before the MiGs even know they're there. And that's going to be the end of it. No. Ta-da! <laughs> Luckily for the North Vietnamese, the American politicians Maybe? step in yet again with another exciting rule of engagement. Guess what? You're not allowed to shoot at enemy aircrafts until you have visual confirmation that it is an enemy aircraft. Uh, I'm going to be honest, like this, this is this is actually rather infuriating to watch. <laughs> that electrician's presentation is lovely. No, this is this is rather infuriating to watch because it's like it, it's no different than if you're working right let's take the military out of it. let's take the politics out of it let's just look at it say you're working at a box grocery store or you're working on a job site and you are told um you must do this specific job you must maintain and maintenance this specific part of this facility whether that be something like checkout lanes whether that be something like what i used to work on like a giant fertilizer vat etc right you must do this this is your job and you're like, well, OK, yeah, I can do this. You're like, OK, yes, you can do this. However, uh, you can't do this if there are people waiting on you. So, for example, in the checkout lane setting, customers waiting on you. If you are in the job site, you know, your buddy walks up to you or somebody walks up to you and starts trying to just shoot the crap with you. And you're just like, dude, I'm literally trying to do my job. Why are you here? Ah, it's fine. But you have to pull away from your work because you have to be available to them. Right. And then suddenly it morphs into, well, not only uh, can you not do this if there is an individual customer or coworker waiting on you, but you can only do this between certain hours, too. And, oh, well, you can't do this uh, within such proximity to your break. And, oh, well, that's going to cause a conflict. So now it's you can't do this in proximity, not only your break, but in proximity to another person's break. And then you get told, well, we need this done. Why aren't you cleaning this machine? Why aren't you maintaining this machine? Right. Okay, well, I can't. I, if I have anybody waiting on me, I can't do this. If I try to do this and it's too close to my break, you've said I can't do this. If I try to do this, you know, and someone else's break is there, I can't do this. What do you physically want from me at that point? And that's removing all of the source material. I'm putting this into a completely mundane civilian setting to showcase that. At what point do these requests become unreasonable or do you tell your boss to shove it? Do you want this machine done or not? Don't yell at me for not this machine or this piece of equipment not getting done when you're not scheduling the proper time for this to get done. Let's even take this to an office job. You must you must do your something I'm familiar with. Uh, you must do your credit training uh, by this date. OK. Well, but if you're off the phones, this counts as ox code usage. This counts as usage that if you are not on the phones, at, at all times, this does count against you. And a policy that tried to go through the place I worked at, if you are away from your or desk for any reason, or if you are not working for any reason outside of your break and lunch period, this will start being taken out of your PTO. Okay, well, then I guess I'll do that. And then you, you suddenly have 40 to 60 calls in queue every single day, every moment of every day. Okay, cool. Guess I got to limit it on that. And oh, well, now we have to have our daily meeting, you know, because we, we got to say hi to each other. We got to talk about each other. We got to talk about our goals, but then it warps into not talking about goals. You see how this in a civilian setting relating to this, that exact same thing happens and it gets overbearing to the people that are actually trying to do their job. I'm not a fan of this management style. Translation, the American F-4 pilots literally are not allowed to start fighting the MiG-21s until the MiG-21s have the no. advantage. No. Which is absolutely insane to think about. Like, literally the equivalent of walking up to an infantryman and being like, hey, here's a sniper rifle. Also, yeah. you're not allowed to shoot people with it. You're only allowed to use a bayonet. <laughs> and yeah. there's no bayonet because we didn't design it with a bayonet lug because it's only designed to shoot people from really far away. Get yeah. bent. And just yeah. in case that wasn't bad enough, what makes this even worse is the fact that most of the F-4 pilots are only trained on the American F-4, which wasn't really designed for up close dogfighting with a gun because it doesn't have a gun. So most of them don't really know how to conduct an up close dogfight because they've never been trained to do it. 
because that's not what their plane is supposed to fucking do. So there's really no good answer, and this goes on for a little while, where basically the F-105s go up, the MiG-21s go up, intercept, the F-105s are then forced to drop all their bombs in the middle of nowhere and take off just so they can survive, the MiG-21s then go and land, and that just repeats itself at nausea. But then in September of 1966, something happened that would change everything because the 8th Fighter Wing out of Udong Thai Royal Air Force Base would get a new commander, and that commander was none other than the legendary fighter pilot, Colonel Robin Olds. And I mean, you can know nothing about this guy, and you already know he's the main character. I mean, yeah. look at the lip sweater on this man. It's the most yeah. magnificent taco flosser I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh my god! Oh, that was great. I'm using that now. Life. Okay, let me break this down for you. Anytime you've ever seen a movie with the cool bad boy character that doesn't follow the rules, it's also a fighter pilot, it's based off of this guy, whether you know it or not. Okay, I want you to understand the gravity of the situation here. This man's mother passed away when he was four years old, and he was raised by a single father that was also a full-time army pilot and a World War I veteran. This guy was essentially bred to be a fighter pilot. He went to West Point where he became an all-American football player at 6'2", 250 pounds. He then went on to become a fighter pilot in World War II. Now, uh -huh. if you shoot down five or more enemy planes, you become an ace pilot. It's kind of a really big deal. And Robin yeah. Olds was a double ace in World War II. This man literally prestiged in the most extreme air-to-air -air combat the world has ever seen, and he's about to become a triple ace in Vietnam. And at the age of 44, nonetheless, how's the mm -hmm. old saying go, beware of an old man in a young man's game? Yeah, <laughs> this is the main character for sure. And like, I, I can attest to that personally. There are people that I'll go uh, sword fight in SCA with that are like 40, 50, 60, I don't think quite 70s, right? But I, I've definitely fought people that are in their, they look like their 60s, and they absolutely just, just, they finesse me like we're talking like Dark Souls rolls behind you, backstabs you like absolute finesse. Not, like, that, that is so true. This also begs the question, though, if this is if the flying ace is to get the five KIAs, right, or, or to get the, the five shoot down five pilots, right? But we haven't had an aerial conflict in how long are there modern ace pilots are there modern or is there a modern like deviation or standard for that because we haven't really had something akin to world war one or world war two recently as far as i'm aware that being said there could be something under any air ops like that i don't know about that i have no business of knowing about so i don't know those great main characters, Robin Olds has a lot of very high-ranking people that don't really like him that much, mostly yeah. because he's not afraid to ruffle a couple of feathers to get his point across. And most recently, the argument that he's been having with the establishment is the fact that the F-4 Phantom, the main fighter jet for the United States military, should probably have a gun on it. He also has an issue with how these new pilots are being trained because they're not really being trained how to actually dogfight. They're just being trained how to haul ass, intercept a plane, and shoot a missile at it, as right. opposed to actually getting into a close quarters fight. And the mm -hmm. chain command is basically telling Robin Olds, like, hey, Hey, look, you're old. They don't do it like that anymore. You were fighting in World War II and P-51 Mustangs and P-38 Lightnings. This is not what's going on anymore. These kids are flying F-4 Phantoms that can fly at 1,400 miles an hour and shoot missiles and take out targets from 30 miles away. We I, I want to impress how asinine that is. And so here's the thing. Oh, oh, respect your elders. Y yes and no, right? So what I'm... Imagine, if you will, that someone was just like, oh, you don't need to know the, the art of war by Sun Tzu. We don't do that anymore. We, we, we don't do it. Literally... Anybody in business will read the art of war. It is such a someone who hasn't personally read it, though. I do understand the impact of, it, especially for CEOs and executive positions. Right? It is a very important read. Oh, but it's an oh, that's some old book. You don't need to worry about that. Or like Musashi's The Five Rings. Ah, it's an old book. You don't need to worry about that. None of that is relevant. I mean, it actually divides up society fairly well, except for politicians but i think that they would fall into the merchant category that masashi mentions they're kind of an oddity and that's kind of more of a you can't even say it's a modern thing because there were magistrates and stuff throughout history I, I don't know anyways but point being right that's like oh you don't need to worry about this thing because this is how we do it now but the problem you run into with that is and we'll relate to a job setting again right you know, this is how we cleaned this machine 20 years ago and it worked just fine versus having a automatic scrubber scraper tool that does it now Okay, that what happens when that tool goes down? Do you know how to clean it? Do you know how the machine works? Do you know how to take apart certain parts, right? Like I used to be able to take apart uh, industrial dishwashers. God, I love those during rush hour. They were great. 
and you know know how to take out the filter take out the drain plug know how to take off the sprayers where the screws were right so if it went down or i had to service it in a certain capacity which what i could service until the specialist got there right you know i i had the ability to do that i wasn't sitting there with just this day's look of just like i don't know how this works so I 100% things like this. Well, why aren't they being trained on dogfighting? Why aren't they being trained on these? Old, well, we don't do that anymore. Okay. But what happens if stuff goes sideways? Are you just going to leave them up the creek without a paddle? I think that's a very important thing to have a discussion on. You don't need to teach them up close dogfighting anymore because they're never actually going to use it because the technology eliminates the need for that. But you know what technology doesn't fix? Politicians being fucking stupid. So now <laughs> everybody has to fight like it's World War II in a dogfight because they're not allowed to use the technology the way they're supposed to because politicians that don't understand what they're talking about get to make up all the rules. So now they're sending Robin Olds to go take over command of the 8th Fighter Wing. He shows up and immediately earns everybody's respect. Keyword earns it yeah. doesn't just get it given to him and the way that he earns it is one of the best examples of leadership that i have ever read about this man shows up to take command of an entire fighter wing as a double ace world war ii pilot and a legend and he decides to immediately put himself on the flight roster as a rookie to get trained on how to better use the f4 phantom because he's not very well acquainted with it and he lets all the men that are lower than him train him on this plane uh -huh. he didn't come in all cocky he wasn't some arrogant prick he just admitted hey i've been doing this for a long time i've flown a lot of planes i'm not super great with the f4 phantom i need to get great with it so i can lead you guys and that's exactly what he did and it immediately earned him all the respect in the world so robin takes some yes. time to get acquainted with the f4 phantom and within a couple of weeks he's already flying the plane better than most of the trainers so now that robin olds is caught up on the f4 phantom to where all of his guys are he is now going to teach these young whippersnappers how to dogfight like it's world war ii and this uh -huh. is like the cool moment from all the movies where old schools teach a new school how to get shit done anyways okay this is rocky uh -huh. teaching adonis creed how to box this is doc teaching and Lightning McQueen that sometimes you got to turn right to go left. And while all of this is happening, Robin Olds, in another great display of leadership, realizes that there's not enough of him to go around and he needs mm -hmm. backup. He needs another badass World War II era pilot to uh -huh. come over and help him get these guys ready. So Olds calls in a couple of favors, gets one of his longtime friends transferred over to the 8th Fighter Wing to help him run the show, and that friend is none other than the legendary pilot Daniel Chappie James Jr., a.k.a. The Black Eagle. Okay, in the late 1930s, what a Chad. early 1940s, this man was a civilian pilot at the Tuskegee Institute that was contracted by the U.S. government to train U.S. pilots how to fly. Okay, if mm -hmm. you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you this is the man that trained the famous Tuskegee Airmen from World War II before eventually enlisting and becoming one himself in 1943. After enlisting, he became an officer, at which point he was deemed too valuable as a trainer, so that's what he did for the duration of World War II, continued to train an entire generation of fighter pilots and never actually saw combat himself. Mm -hmm. Then, in Korea, he would fly over a hundred combat missions before working at the Pentagon where he would end up meeting Robin Olds. After this, he goes on to become the first black man to become a four-star general in the United States military. What this man Chad. is also a complete badass, so Uncle Sam is essentially playing Operation Bolo on co-op mode with two main characters on the field. So Chappie shows up to the 8th Fighter Wing, is reunited with his old friend Robin Olds, they become this extremely effective chain of command, and they are absolutely loved by all of their subordinates. Because of that, this leadership duo is given a nickname that is originally intended as a term of endearment, although by today's standards is probably not very politically correct, and that nickname was Black Man and Robin. Now, all this happens in like the span of three months, so December... <laughs> it's actually really great, though. That... That... Oh my god, that's perfect. 1966, they're running combat operations, and Robin Olds finally gets an idea of how to stop these new badass MiG-21s. Okay. By this point, Robin Olds is completely caught on to the MiG-21's entire strategy. They have zero interest in actually fighting with the F-4s, which is driving Robin Olds nuts because he's a World War II era fighter pilot. That's exactly the type of shit that he's into. These right. MiG-21 pilots, however, just want to go up there, use guerrilla warfare tactics where they just either hit the F-105s or don't hit the F-105s and just convince them to drop their payload prematurely and waste everybody's time and then take back off right the big 21s have zero interest in tangling with the f4s which robin Ol so at this point it seems like they don't have an interest in the actual engagement which it's lacking that follow-through you can go they're gonna go up they're gonna harass them and then they're just gonna leave if they need to hit it once or twice cool but they're not in it for a pr they're, they're not in it to have that engagement they're not in it to have that conflict they're not wanting to go toe to toe with the F4s. And that's super interesting as a um, as a point that he's noticing because it's like, as somebody that was a World War II pilot, I'm assuming he's just like, oh, come on. 
They're just teasing me at this point. Come on, we, we did stuff way harsher back in the day. Come on now. There's a little bit of a court to this, a little dance to this. Come on now, right? Don't tease me like this. And it was probably a little fury to a degree. Like they're just they're just going up there, just <laughs> just being dicks up here. Come on, we gotta take it to them. Interprets as I need to force these MiG 21s to fight me. So, right. how's he going to do that? Well, here's his plan. The reason the MiG 21s can identify the F 105s so efficiently is because the F 105s have a jamming pod on them that basically disrupts and interferes with the surface to air missiles down below. It mm. messes up their radar so that the F 105s aren't going to get taken out by all the anti aircraft stuff on the ground. Problem with that is, is that emits a frequency that the North Vietnamese can see. They then know that a bunch of F 105s are coming, so they scramble the MiGs. Right. So, Robin Olds decides, hey, let's take those jamming pods, mount them to mine and all the guys' F4s, and then we'll fly there like we're F-105s in a bombing formation, oh, and no. the MiGs will come attack us. And by the time they get close enough to realize that we're not F-105s, ideally, it's going to be too late. Yeah, the legendary World War II uh -huh. double fighter aces just went to the chain of command and requested permission to execute the old Wiley e. Coyote in a sheep costume <laughs> to catch the Roadrunner <laughs> strategy. Now, probably going to work, but there are a bunch of problems with this idea. Biggest problem right out of the gate is this doesn't solve the issue with rules of engagement because remember, you're not allowed to fire on the enemy until you have visual confirmation that it is your enemy. Right. And by then, the MiG 21s have an edge in air to air combat. Okay, yeah. not a big deal though because Robin has a two step plan for that as well. Okay, step number one, he knows that they only have 12 to 16 MiG 21s. So he's just going to roll in with 28 F4s. Okay, just oh. completely overwhelm them, even if they do have an edge in air to air combat. Okay, step number two, which is quite frankly the big ask, he wants the entire US military to shut down all air operations operations over Southeast Asia while he conducts this operation. He wants wow. the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, none of them to have any birds in the sky whatsoever. And his reason for that is so that he can bypass the rules of engagement. You yeah. see, the only reason the politicians are enforcing that rule of engagement where you have to have visual confirmation before you fire on an uh -huh. enemy plane is because there's a ton of planes in the air over Southeast Asia at all times. And Vietnam is already super controversial over in America. And the last thing the politicians want to have to deal with is headlines that an American plane shot down another American plane. So they just made the rule. You're not allowed to shoot at anything unless you can visually see 100% for certain that it is, in fact, an enemy. So if I, lo I love this. Okay, like contextually, that does make sense. That in itself, making sure that there is no friendly fire, I can see the logic and justification behind that. However, I'm pretty sure that there's some sort of, at least I, I guess in modernity, I'm assuming this would be more so the case. I'm not sure about this era in history. There's got to be some redundancy or there's got to be some communication features to confirm if it is an enemy or an ally. I, I don't know. I'd be very curious to hear about the... Uh, what is not, you know, redacted or what could actually be shared publicly. I'd be very curious in regards to how this would have been done back in the day, how you would differentiate friend from foe. And, it, you know, if this was a kind of redundant policy that came into play that really did nothing but hamper the U.S. military. Robin can make sure that the only planes in the sky are his guys and the enemy, he should right. be able to go bombs away the entire time and not have to worry about it. So obviously this is a massive request and the chain of command says yes. Wow. You son of a nice. <laughs> Okay, so now the last thing we got to figure out, how do we make sure that these MiG-21s don't slip away because they're so nimble and they're so fast, they could pull a tight maneuver and be back at base before we're going to be able to catch them. So how are we going to prevent that? As okay. soon as the MiG-21s take off and get in the air, they're going to send half of the F-4s to haul ass past the entire future battlefield, and they're just going to do hot laps around the enemy airfield, making it so the enemy can't go to land without fighting through those F-4s first, which right. effectively is going to give the pilots of the MiG-21s two options. They can stand and fight the F-4s, retreat, and fight the other F-4s, or they can retreat, have nowhere to land, and eventually run out of gas. And remember, uh -huh. the F-4s have a much larger gas tank, so they are definitely going to run out of gas first. This is actually beautiful. This is why I actually like hearing about these kind of strategies and stuff, because it truly is brilliant. Because It's imagine if you're playing Call of Duty, you're playing a, uh, not necessarily, but you're playing any like kind of team-based game, right? And you're, you're, you're all pretty confident in your abilities and say you pair off, right? So you and two buddies go to fight, you know, people, that you know, are going to come down mid and you're going to come down the, the middle of a uh, shoot house, right? And call of duty. Right. And then, uh, you guys, your other half of your team heads around to the spawn point, you know, to catch and one, any stragglers or two, what the intent on this is, is to effectively just spawn camp them. Or if they return to the spawn to help their teammates or do anything to return to their spawn point, suddenly they have to 
fight through you. They have to run from you and eventually just <laughs> just they're going to run out of gas in this situation or and, and they can't it, it puts it, it pinches it between a hammer and an anvil at this point. And this is actually brilliant for planning and forethought. And I'm pretty sure this has a uh, a, a hand in how the uh, the no community, the, the no communication there, no no one else can be in the air, no air operations at the time this is going. I'm sure why that's passed as well. I'm sure, one, the people that had to go through and approve this request were annoyed by all of these rules of engagement to begin with. I'm sure that had a hand in it. But also that there was a solid plan backed by two legendary pilots. I'm pretty sure this is why this request was even looked at in a serious capacity, much less passed. So it's a perfect plan. There's just one small problem left. How are we going to know when the MiG-21s take off and leave the airfield? Because if we send the F-4s out too soon, then the MiG-21s won't take off at all, and then we can't bomb them on the ground, and it defeats the entire purpose of the mission. Easy problem to solve. We're going to get two spy planes, the C-130B2, aka the Silver Dawn. At this point in time, it is a state-of-the-art electronic warfare spy plane, and it's going to be able to receive all the enemy radio transmissions, so they're going to be able to tell as soon as the enemy MiG-21s take off. And obviously, given the fact that that was such an easy problem to solve, bureaucracy is obviously going to step in and make it extremely difficult because the US military only has like 20 of these Silver Dawn spy planes and while they are technically the property of the United States Air Force, they are directly under the command of the NSA, the National Security Agency, mm -hmm. and they are super duper stingy about whoever gets to use these planes. Mm -hmm. Basically, the NSA gets final say as to whether or not this plane gets to participate in this mission, and that means that they're going to have to go through some stupid bureaucratic process where they ask for permission, it gets run up the chain of command, like 30 people deep and then yeah. finally some bureaucrat has to take responsibility they're not going to do that because they don't want to put their ass on the line <laughs> so it's probably just going to be a big fat no you can't use this plane even though it's probably going to make the whole mission work now this right. is normally the part of the story where the hero strategically transfers a piece of equipment <laughs> to an alternate location so that he can get the job done however he doesn't have to do that because what they do instead is decide to not tell the nsa anything but what mama don't know wow don't hurt her. Ooh. Nice. And when I say they're not going to yeah. tell the NSA anything, I mean they are somehow going to keep it a secret from the NSA, the whole part of the story where the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, and the Army ground every single bird that's not on this mission. They're going to somehow keep that a secret from the fucking spy agency <laughs> so that they go ahead and send up their two Silver Dawns doing hot laps around the Gulf of Tonkin that they have going around every single day. Uh -huh. So that those two planes are in the air participating on this mission, whether the NSA knows it or not. And then as soon as the mission kicks off, they're going to radio over to them and just have them tell them whether or not the MiG-21s took off. It's both genius and hilarious because now, even if the NSA does find out after the fact and get all pissed off, all the Air Force chain of command has to do is be like, oh, you guys didn't get that memo? We sent it. At which yeah. point they're basically... <laughs> Did, did you try talking with your coworkers? Did you not get this? I mean, is this not your specialty? What do you mean you're not going? No, what do you mean you don't know what's going on in your own workplace? I feel like there was absolutely a meeting after this, and I feel some NSA personnel potentially got chewed out. Oh my god, this is brilliant going to be forced to just drop the issue because none of them are going to want to take responsibility for not passing along the memo that never actually got sent. So that's it. This mission gets approved. Operation Bolo is going to happen. So they hurry up. They get all the jamming pods off of F-105s. They mount them on the F-4s. And while that's going okay. on, they schedule it with the entire U.S. military, all four branches that nobody is to have planes in the air on January 2nd, 1967, except for the NSA, of course. Somebody forgot to tell them. So January 2nd rolls. I love that. Uh... <laughs> So what I'm hearing is the army, the navy. Um, oh God, I'm gonna sound like an idiot. I'm totally spacing on the branches. I'm so sorry. Uh, army, navy, um, air force, not oh, space force. That's re that's recent. Was it coast guard? I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Every military personnel. I am doing my best. But the, when you get all these branches, what I'm trying to get across, when you get all of these branches together agreeing on something, I've seen the memes. I've absolutely seen the memes. When you get them agreeing on something, <laughs> you've created a common dangerous enemy. <laughs> around the silver dawn spy planes are already in the air the f4s are on the airstrip with the jamming pods mounted and they're ready to go and it's fucking cloudy and overcast out which is no. not good for this entire mission but also fuck it there's nothing they can do they have to run this mission right now they shut down the skies over all of southeast asia to get this shit done it has to happen right now or it's never gonna happen but i mean hey it should all work out i mean even inside of the art of war sun Tzu once said and i quote oh no you can plan a pretty picnic but you can't predict the weather this is so true and this is why 
why we do. <laughs> yeah. Army, uh, Marine Corps. I thought Marine Corps was part of Navy specifically. Space Force and Coast Guard. Yeah, so it would be Army, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard at this point in time, would it not? I am having to look on Google, so I want to make sure I'm having the most accurate information. And I absolutely should be chastised for not knowing my military uh, military branches in history. So wanted to make sure I was addressing that really quick. But yeah, you can, you can have the best laid plans you can possibly do. You can have everything perfect. You can't predict if it's going to be overcast. You can't predict if it's going to be cloudy. In Idaho, you can't predict it five minutes from now. It's just going to start raining or snowing. You, you just can't. This this is why, once again, right, Art of War, how I was mentioning earlier in regards to, oh, that's old. You don't need to worry about that. It's almost like there's relevant wisdom. Do you have to listen to everything? Not necessarily, but it's almost like you should look at things and look at them critically and think, huh, what does this mean? Oh, this applies to a number of things. You can make the best laid plans for a new product, but you can't predict it, that the climate's going to turn just 90 degrees to the left and suddenly all your laid plans for marketing and selling this product don't work. Interesting. It's almost like Kip knows what he's talking about sometimes on a very rare occasion. Wait a minute. <laughs> How did the lyrics to Miss Jackson get inside of my son Zuba? <laughs> I, I guess I was Andre 3000. I apologize a trillion times. Anyways, point stands. The mission goes. So the F-4s get put up in the air and there's seven flights of F-4s. Each flight is four F-4s for a total of 28 and they are all named after cars. Flight one is named Olds, being led by Robin Olds. Flight two is Ford, led by Chappie. And flight three is Rambler, being led by Captain John Stone. And okay. everything they do follows exactly what the F-105s would normally do. They're taking the same route at the same elevation, using the same radio frequencies. They're even using bomber call signs in case somehow their radio transmissions get intercepted. And they're emitting the same jamming frequencies as well, using those pods. So right. sure enough, the MiGs show up, and wouldn't you know it, the first guy to see one is none other than Robin Olds. He immediately splits his flight into two groups of two, and Olds and his wingman take off after this MiG. Olds fires two radar guided missiles and they both end up losing their lock and he misses entirely. He then closes the distance more so he can fire a heat seeking missile uh -huh. and it's a dud. And then the MiG that he's chasing goes into the clouds and he loses them entirely. And as soon as he loses sight of that MiG, another MiG is screaming past him going the opposite direction. So uh -huh. close that Olds can't just make a normal turn. Without batting okay. an eye, Olds immediately hits a vector roll, which is a technique right out of the World War II dogfighting handbook. It's uh -huh. essentially you nose up and you do a backflip corkscrew maneuver and Amazing. end up behind your enemy. And as uh -huh. he's mid vector roll upside down pulling G's, he gets a radio transmission from Captain Johnson of Rambler Group saying, hey, I just got into the battlefield. Where are you? I heard that you're engaging an enemy. Olds finishes the vector roll, gets behind this MiG, radios back to stone finds your own, and then fires a <laughs> missile and blows up the first MiG-21. At this point, the rest of the MiGs kind of figure out that the Americans have tricked them and they are now basically locked inside of the Thunderdome and they're going to have to fight their way out to have any chance at all. And the entire thing devolves into one enormous dogfight. I remember... I, I feel that it, it, the, the surprise from the MiG pilots at that point, like, wait a minute, we've been duped. My God, we're actually going to have to fight in this one. That is that that is not a comfortable situation to be in. At that point, it, it's the whole the predator becomes the prey flip. Oh my god. For the other four flights aren't there yet. They're lagging behind a couple of minutes, so we still just have the original three flights of Olds, Ford, and Rambler for a total right. of 12 F4s going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an unknown number of MiGs, potentially as many as 16. Now, cutting over to Ford flight, Chappie has a MiG on his tail and he has no idea because his radio is malfunctioning and he can't hear his wingman telling him, hey, you have an enemy on your tail. So, his wingman does the only thing he can think of. He handles it by himself. Bear right. in mind, it is Chappie, the MiG, and then his teammate. So, his teammate can't fire any missiles because he can't risk that missile accidentally locking onto Chappie. So he has to perform another vector roll. He noses up, does a corkscrew, backflips, and that puts him at 90 degrees. Oh my God, yes. Previously. So now he's coming this way towards the enemy and he fires heat seeking missiles and blows up the MiG-21 behind Chappie without Chappie even knowing that it happened. Uh -huh. Chappie then immediately engages two MiGs that are directly in front of him. And while that's going on, cutting back over to Olds, his wingman informs him that, hey, his second fuel tank isn't feeding fuel for some reason, so he's already low on fuel. They are five minutes into this dogfight. Robin Olds makes the call that he is going to escort his wingman out of the target 
target area and back to the airfield, which is yet again, another phenomenal display of leadership. He could have ordered somebody else to do it. So he right. could have stayed in the fight and soaked up more kills and padded his stats, but yeah. no, he did it himself. For the next eight minutes, the remaining 10 F4s engage every MiG-21 they can find until they have either been blown up or have disappeared and are hiding in the clouds. So at mm -hmm. this point, the F4s call it a day. They head back to base. The other four flights of F4s didn't even make it to the target zone in time. So only 12 of the 28 F4s in the air actually engage the enemy. As the mm -hmm. F4s start showing up and they start landing, the ground crews are there waiting with anticipation to find out how it went. I mean, this is one of the coolest missions ever done. Probably the coolest thing a lot of these guys are ever going to be involved with. So they're super Super pumped to hear how it went as the f4 canopies open up the pilots start holding up fingers of ones and twos telling everybody <laughs> how many migs they shot down and the entire place turns into an enormous party they're celebrating all these guys are just absolutely pumped that they shot down a bunch of mig 21s so mm -hmm. they debrief trying to figure out everything that happened in this 13 minutes of absolute chaos and first and foremost the best news not a single american pilot got shot down then they figure out that they for sure shot down seven mig 21s with an additional two probable for a total of as many as nine and bear in mind that the North Vietnamese only had somewhere between 12 and 16 to begin with. So at wow. worst, Operation Bolo has effectively destroyed at least half of North Vietnam's MiG-21 fleet. Okay, and there's always going to be that one guy in the comments section like, Buh. Buh, I can't believe you made an entire video about them only shooting down seven aircrafts. Buh. Okay, first I mean, realistically, you do it. Be my guest. Get, get up in that plane. Okay, you don't want to do that? Okay, fine. Sit down. Shut up. We're going to have a conversation here. <laughs> First of all, this isn't a video game. This is real life. And going 7-0 and o against peer aircrafts is absolutely incredible. Secondly, uh -huh. in a way, Operation Bolo didn't just destroy half of the enemy MiG-21 fleet. It also destroyed their entire fleet's operational capability. And that is because now they can't make a mistake like that again because no. they've lost half of their fucking planes. If they do that, they won't yes. have any. In addition to that... Now, they have no way of knowing if it's actually a bunch of F-105s are getting sent up to fight yep. or if it's another trap. So now the remaining MiG-21s are going to be infinitely more cautious and more sparingly used, which is going to save countless F-105s in the long run. So in conclusion, Operation Bolo has gone down in history as one of the most successful ruses of all time, and it serves as a shining example of why you should never underestimate a couple of old men in a young man's game. No. In addition to that, it also proved something that I previously thought to be impossible, that you can, in fact, Fact, overcome the stupidity of politicians. The bad yeah. news is, is that you have to be a superhero level badass yeah. like Robin Olds or Daniel Chappie James Jr. Thank you for watching. Oh, Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. Yeah, no, you have to actually just be the protagonist. <laughs> you look pretty hot. <laughs> oh, that's going on a blooper reel. <laughs> <laughs> Ask where are you? The response was, go find your own. <laughs> I thought that was pretty selfish of him at the time, but there's plenty left. <laughs> Deliberately planned fighter sweep went just as we'd hoped. The MiGs came up, the MiGs were aggressive, we tangled, they lost. Nice. First of all, if you have not checked out The Fat Electrician or his second channel, The Fat Files, which I do know there are some people still that don't know The Fat Electrician has a second channel, do yourself a favor and go check out both of his channels. He puts out a lot of great work. He puts out a lot of just awesome content. I love whenever he releases a new video, not just because I get to react to it, because people, I guess, find uh, something from my reactions to his content, but because gen genuinely this is the content that we should be seeing more of on YouTube. There is a wealth of content that is just waifu memes and Genshin Impact MMD memes and drama baiting and rehashing the same drama 20 times over, right? How someone can just be like, oh, well, Actman put out a new video and well, you know, I haven't really been feeling Actman since his Payday 3 thing. It, it, look, to me at a certain point, you just got to walk away. But this, this is the kind of content that I stick around for. And anyone that I react to, by extension, is someone that I would wholeheartedly just endorse. Like, look, go go check out their content. They seem like a super cool person, super legit. And, uh, you know, if, if you want more of this, definitely go check them out. So I wanted to do that. The uh, second point of that is love the whole operation. The entirety of Operation Bolo was absolutely phenomenal, uh, especially seeing all the branches work together. And I do want to take a minute again to apologize for not 
recognizing all of the branches of the military, especially at this time. I do know that the Space Force was a modern addition. As far as I'm aware, the Marine Corps is a subsection of the U.S. Navy. So I do hope that my Google research throughout being the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard was correct. And if not, I absolutely implore you, please correct me where I can. I don't want to spread misinformation. And as always, don't take anything I say as the the truth the end all don't i i absolutely implore you to do your own research or if you have specialty in the field to absolutely correct me where i may be wrong and if uh, i am wrong i'll definitely pin that comment uh, on in, in the explanation of the error uh the third thing as well to consider as well is that this doesn't end on the battlefield you have to understand that uh, these migs they were soviet right correct What's the Kremlin going to do? What is the Kremlin's response going to be to this? When this gets back to the NSA, when this gets back to Washington, D.C., what is the Kremlin's response going to be to this? This is not me belittling this by Operation Bola by any means. This is not me, you know, um, throwing any shade at the the service members that did this. No, I have nothing but respect for service members. Management, we get into a little bit of a discussion with, but I personally don't have to deal with them. And my concern, as I said, really only lies with the on the ground personnel, the ones that, uh, you know, go in and then unfortunately have to deal with the bureaucracy and government issued supplies. Um, you know, so the, the response from the Kremlin, response from uh, China at this point in time, you know, I understand the weight and the, and I'm cognizant of the events of the era, specifically the Red Scare, communism, et cetera and what needs to be considered i'm not unknown to that part of the argument and thus leading into i guess the fourth thing where we've made the meme about it recently ah kip politics kip finger waves kip politics in the video you know at, at a certain point in time i just it mostly just comes down to i try not to engage in it not because i don't engage not that i have an aversion to it mostly because i have these discussions every day every day and at a certain point i get tired and at the i also want to just be reasonable i don't want to polarize an audience i don't want to polarize people and i know that there's people that have been very dissatisfied with recent content in regards to well kip you're just not how you used to be you're not yourself you're not focused on positivity i i am trying my best i assure you i, I do hear you i do see you i'm doing my best and uh you know i, I there are discussions that i would like to have in regards to Social issues such as modern dating, such as learning about history like Operation Bolo, you know, learning about firearms such as more things about the 1911 or the AR platform. And, you know, I, I try to make it as politics free as I can because, you know, I want to make sure that someone in Germany, someone in uh, Singapore, someone in, I have a couple of viewers from Russia actually, you know, that they can just watch. They can just, hey, this is not another idiot American. This is someone who's trying to make a difference in the world, who's trying their best to just do what they can to talk to everybody and try to get as many, you know, viewpoints as possible into that consideration. Um, just some things to consider. And, uh, you know, I do hope that everyone finds that this has been some sort of, you know, enjoyment, entertaining. Hope that, you know, my words don't come across as me just trying to clout chase or anything like that. But yes, if you haven't, go check out Fat Electrician and the Fat Files. That is going to do it for me this time. I absolutely enjoyed this and, you know, nothing but uh, the best for the Fat Electrician. And because uh, of the channels, you know, I think he's a super legit dude. Would recommend him to anybody that I interact with. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.